Hello and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for our webinar uh, here at Campaign HQ. My name is Nicole Schlinger, the president and founder. And today we're going to be talking about So Now What? Uh, four ways to effectively communicate during the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we keep the conversation with going with people, with your audience at exactly the time they want to hear from you most? And before we get into it, I wanted to let you know uh, the face that you're looking at on the screen is our own Sue Hall. So uh, she's been here with us at the company since 2011. And oftentimes when we make your live calls, you send us a script and we uh, work on that together. And then we talk about uh, the people that you want us to contact. And at the end, we send you back a report and all of your data. Well, in the middle of that, there's some real people who are out there on the front line communicating your message. And we love to highlight those people and let you know who they are so you can see their faces. So let's get started. Um, a little bit about us here at Campaign HQ, and here's two more of those faces. That's Janet and Barb, and they look very sweet, but trust me, they can get into a lot of trouble. Um, here at Campaign HQ, uh, we really want to be more than just a call center for you. We want to be a trusted partner and an ally that helps you deliver your message and helps you win. Um, we do that with context, which is peer-to-peer -peer text messaging, uh, both SMS messages and MMS messages, where we send pictures, GIFs, MP4 videos, to really make that interactive conversation much more interesting and much richer and more engaging for your audience. We do that with live calls and with automated calls, with telephone town halls where you can communicate safely and effectively with a large group of people, especially right now, especially in this environment. Uh, the way to connect with people in their homes is through a telephone town hall. And we've been doing all of this since 1999. So we've seen a lot of changes and we're here to use that experience and we're here to help. Um, I saw this the other day in the New York Times and I thought at last something from the New York Times that's not fake news. And it was an opinion piece called, I just called to say the phone is back. And one of the things that people, uh, Americans all over the country are rediscovering in this unique time is the value and the beauty of a phone call. Uh, being able to hear the other person, to be able to understand their voice tone and detect their nuance, that's something you'll never get from Facebook Messenger, you'll never get from just an emoji. Uh, it's that real human connection. And right now for you to make that connection, we need to be able to do that in a safe way. We can't do that at the door, we can't do it at an event, but we absolutely can do that over the phone for you. So let's get started. Uh, we're gonna talk today about four ways you can make the most of the opportunity to keep the conversation going, to reach your audience, to engage them with your election, with your issue, with your message. So let's talk about the first way we can do that. Okay, uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is building a grassroots army now that you can mobilize later, and specifically doing that through a telephone petition drive. Uh, the thing that's really exciting now is you have an audience that is at home and they are eager for a distraction from what's going on in the world right now. What's happening is it's scary, it's uncertain, it's difficult, and, uh, and your call is often a welcome distraction to that. That's what we've been finding over the last two to three weeks is that people are welcoming our phone call, they're welcoming our conversation on the issue in a way they wouldn't have a month or two months ago. Um, in a telephone petition drive, you'll see one, a sample uh, script on the right. Um, we call voters, we ask them to add their name to a petition on an important issue, and for the people who agree to lend their name to that cause, we collect their email address and we ask them to volunteer. Uh, right now, when you have people whose attention you can capture, this is a great way to build a very large list of supporters that when the world returns to its normal self in four or six or eight weeks from now, you have a base from which to mobilize. This is a wonderful tool for issue advocacy organizations that are looking to mobilize support or opposition to legislation uh, when Congress and state legislatures return, which they will. Um, you can be, you know, as an example, we've seen uh, many organizations that are against a gas tax or against a gas a tax increase in general use this really effectively. 
it's also a wonderful way if you are a candidate campaign to uh, draw distinctions between your candidate, your campaign, um, and the other candidate on vote determinative wedge issues. As an example, if you are very strongly pro Second Amendment, but perhaps your primary opponent is for gun control, this could be a great way to draw a wedge on your likely primary voters, is to say, join my petition to support the Second Amendment and to have a member of Congress who will support your values in Washington, D.C., uh, and then you can use that as a, as a way to turn people out later on on an issue where you greatly differ from your opponent. So it has, uh, it has an impact on both the legislative advocacy side and it has an impact on uh, the election side. Uh, introducing yourself. Um, now is a wonderful time to introduce yourself to your potential voters. So many primaries in so many states have been put off. So you can either look at that at, to your as something that's to your detriment, or you can look at it as an opportunity, an opportunity to introduce yourself to get that second chance to make a first impression. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are seeing a lot of our campaigns and candidates do right now is take a quick 20 second video on their phone and send that out via peer-to-peer -peer text message. Essentially, it's a way to put a 20 second TV commercial directly on the mobile phone of the voter you are trying to reach. Now, texting people videos is great, but if all you do is text someone a video and say, here's my video, you really haven't taken full advantage of what peer-to-peer -peer text messaging is meant to be. It's meant to be a conversation. It's meant to be two-way. It's meant to be interactive. So in that message, let people know, hey, would you watch my video and, if you lo and tell me what you think of it? Ask people what they think and draw them into the conversation and use that to identify your supporters and identify people who might otherwise not have paid attention to your campaign earlier. Uh, brightening seniors day with an automated call. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is that, uh, you know, while folks are indeed dropping landlines, uh, the folks that are in that 65 and older range are not. Uh, the majority of them do have a landline phone. Right now, they are the people who are most staying at home, most following those practices of, of social distancing. They're, having, they're not even going to the grocery store. They're having volunteers, friends, family, church members go to the grocery store. You are talking to an audience that has a landline phone and is at home. And when I say brightening their day, I'm going to play you a sample call and uh, um, hope that you can see what I mean. Um, Simply sharing a message or urging them to vote is one thing, uh, but uh, trying to appeal to seniors with something that uh, appeals specifically to them. And I'll go ahead and play this message. Hello, my friend. Matt Boone here. Yeah, that Matt Boone was a love letter to the sand guy. And yes, I'm still singing at occasional concerts, but today, because of the reports of tomorrow's election there in Virginia, I'm calling to sing the praises of a highly respected member of the House of Delegates Nick Freitas. I hope you know his name already. Nick Freitas. Because of a snafu and papers filed with the registrar's office, you may be asked to write in his name and you'll have to spell it correctly. So it's Nick, F R E I T A S. Let me tell you this while he is combat veteran, a Green Beret warrior, I can assure you his liberal opponents will challenge any misspelling of Nick's name. So please do me, Pat Boo, Virginia, and of course, Nick. Favor. Be careful to spell it out. Nick Freitas. God bless you. God bless Virginia. Bless Nick Freitas. And God help our beloved country. Paid for by the 60 Plus Association and not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. 703-807-2070. Um, and for those of you who, uh, who know Pat Boone, uh, he is absolutely, uh, he is the Justin Bieber of the 65 and up crowd. He was, uh, he was just a beloved movie and uh, movie star and singer from their youth. And so something like that is going to be listened to. Now, obviously that example was from last year, uh, but you can see how uh, a senior would absolutely stay on the line and listen to that. And if that was on their voicemail, they would listen to the entire thing. Um, last but not least, live advocacy with support and voting method capture. Something that we are seeing in states across the country is 
not just changes in voting dates, but changes in voting methods. Uh, you guys might have seen in the Wisconsin election today, uh, last night, a, uh, the governor tried to postpone the election. A judge overruled that. Uh, they are having a vote by mail only election, and the postmark deadline is today. Um, you know, another example is Ohio, where the, uh, they're now having a, uh, a, a vote by mail only election that is on April 28th. Um, Alabama is another state where they were postponed in, from March 31st uh, into July, uh, and all of a sudden the rules for absentee voting, voting by mail, are completely different. You have an audience of people who do not have an ingrained habit of voting early and voting by mail. And so the information you're sharing with people that they can't, when the election is, that they can vote by mail and how they can do it is absolutely critical, absolutely invaluable, and not something you would think of in ordinary times because in regular times, your regular primary voters know how to vote. So it's taking a step back and re-educating people on how to vote because these changes are really gonna trip people up. Uh, now, before I go on to the next slide, I see that some folks have joined. Um, if you joined after I started, uh, we have everyone on mute just to uh, make sure there's no background noise. But if you have any questions or comments, just put them in the chat box. Uh, I can see the chat box while I'm giving the presentation. And let's make this a back and forth conversation. So anything you want to share, just put it in the chat box and I'll try to get to it um, as soon as I can, as soon as I see it or at the appropriate moment. Hello, uh, Moving on to the next one. Don't need to hear Pat Boone again. Um, going on again to uh, introducing yourself. Um, safely collecting signatures to get your name on the ballot. You can do this through a combination of calls and context text messaging. This is getting yourself on the ballot is a challenge we were already seeing even before this crisis, even before this pandemic began. Um, we did work with, um, an organization that was trying to get a city councilman recalled. And they would send volunteers door to door and invariably 75, 80% of the doors they would hit, no one was there. And so they'd send a volunteer out on a two or three hour trip and they'd come back only having talked to maybe five or six people and getting two or three signatures. Uh, and in the compressed time frame to get the petitions, that just wasn't going to work. Um, what we did was we put together a script where we said, we explained to people why this particular member of the city council had so abused the, the power and privilege of their office, why they needed to be recalled and asked, may we send a volunteer to your home to sign this petition? Extremely effective because all of a sudden we took our most limited resource, which is the volunteer at the door, and we greatly exponentially increased their effectiveness because we only sent them to doors of someone who agreed to sign, could get their family members who were in the household to sign, and we knew they would be home at the date and time we went to the door. So we greatly magnified the effect of the volunteers. As a side note, that campaign to recall the city councilman, we had enough petitions to get that recall on the ballot. The day our team went to present the petitions, he resigned. So we actually saved the taxpayers thousands of dollars and this needless election by convincing him that resigning was a good thing. The writing was on the wall. He wasn't going to stay in office. Um, another place where we've seen candidates having trouble getting on the ballot um, is Republican candidates in urban areas. Um, because most people who live in urban areas um, and are Republican, in this particular instance, they are young professionals. They live in condos, co-ops, doorman protected buildings. Uh, we couldn't send volunteers to them. There was no way to get a volunteer to their door. Um, the, it, same thing happens on the other side of the spectrum. In very rural areas where the homes are so spread apart, you can't go door to door effectively either because you can't get to enough doors in an hour if you have to drive 15, 20 minutes between each one. Um, we effectively, very effectively use this on the text message side, and I think that's going to come up right here. Uh, the way that we did this was uh, we asked people if we could stop by and get their signature. Uh, and so only the people who replied and said yes, uh, we reach back out to them. We found a date and time, and for the most part, we eat, we our volunteer went and buzzed at the door uh, or waited and had that person come downstairs. 
Uh, the South Philly GOP got 11 of the 12 candidates on their slate onto the ballot. That was the first time they were able to do that. And this text message campaign, this back and forth interaction was absolutely the critical factor. They were able to take their limited volunteers and absolutely magnify them. If you have candidates with primaries that are June 30th and earlier, if you have deadlines to turn in your petition signatures that are in April, May, early June, this is going to be a struggle for you. This is going to be tough. Um, what I'm suggesting is when you text people and they agree to sign your, your petition, take them to your website, have them print it out, sign it, and mail it back to you. We want to make sure that we do this really, really safely and effectively, but we also want to make sure that you get your candidate on the ballot, because if you don't get on the ballot, nothing else we talk about matters. Uh, First-time candidates are going to have a struggle because they don't have name recognition. Um, you're going to need to have some kind of personal contact, some kind of personal connection in order to get people to take that extra step of printing out the petition, signing it, returning it to you in a safe way, uh, in a way that just minimizes that that person-to-person -person contact. Uh, the same is going to be for incumbents looking to connect with low propensity voters and new registrants. You're not going to be able to knock on their doors. You're not going to be able to get them to come to in-person events. This is a great way to get to those new voters. And lastly, ballot initiative committees. Uh, ballot initiative committees need lots of signatures to get their, get their initiative onto the ballot, but they oftentimes they don't have that same person-to-person -person connection that a candidate themselves has. The candidate has that power of personality, that power to connect with you. Ballot initiatives need walkers going door to door, and this is a wonderful, perfect way to replace that contact, replace that connection with something that you can still do safely, and you know you can essentially still get into the home of that voter without physically getting into the home of that voter. And this is something you really need to consider, really need to think about, look at your rules and make sure that you're, you're not going to, uh, in some states you have to have physical hard signatures, in some states a uh, snapshot that someone texts you on their phone will do. Make sure you are really looking at the rules in your locality so that you don't wind up with your candidate not on the ballot or your initiative not on the ballot. Uh, but now truly is the time to be thinking about this. Um, surveying your audience. Uh, now is a wonderful time to gather data about your audience because they're at home. Uh, we are seeing people pick up their phone at two and three times the rate that they were picking up their phone uh, six and eight weeks ago. So if you want to gather data about your audience, if you want to ask them where they stand, do it now. For voters who have landline phones, automated surveys are perfect because they are inexpensive and fast. And not only are they inexpensive and fast, they also quickly weed out which phone numbers are in are working and which phone numbers are disconnected. And we all know these days when you are dealing with a landline universe, you're dealing with a high percentage of disconnects because people have dropped their landline and moved to a mobile. If you have volunteers six, eight, ten weeks from now live calling a landline list, and you did not call out all those disconnects, you are wasting your volunteers' time. You are wasting truly the most precious resource that you will ever have on your campaign. So do an automated survey now, get the disconnects out of, out of your list, and get that low-hanging fruit. Get the people who will answer that call to answer it quickly so you know how to advocate to them later. The next step, live calls, uh, live ID calls to landlines and mobile at context surveys to mobile phones. Um, I believe we've got an example of one right here. Um, this is a great example of uh, a survey that we did a while back. We actually did this well before um, our world got turned upside down. Uh, this went to uh, delegates, this um, state delegates to a state Republican convention. And um, this was a delegate battle. We had about 2,500 landlines and 2,500 cell phones. Of the 2,500 cell phones, we called through that list four times. We attempted every single record four times. A thousand people gave us at least one answer, answered the phone, picked up at least. 1,500 never did. Now I tell you, um, and you know, guys probably know this from your experience, 
those 1,500 people, I could have dialed them another 10 times and I, the result would have been negligible. Instead, we did an MMS. Uh, this was a peer-to-peer -peer text message. We used an image to draw attention to it, to get people to notice it. And they, uh, when they clicked on it, they were directed to a Google survey. Now, granted, this is a very interested audience. These are people who are self-selecting members of a Republican state convention. Uh, so they are politically engaged. They're interested. They want you to know their opinion. Uh, we gathered opinions on over 150 of the remaining 1,500 people just with this survey. So really, really effective. Um, and then I believe we've got an example of a live ID call that we used uh, recently as well. Uh, again, asking people, are you going to vote? Who are you going to vote for? And then the campaign can use this for their turnout plan, for their advocacy plan, et cetera. But now is really the time to do it. Next having a conversation. Uh, telephone town halls, um, for most campaigns and organizations, their telephone town hall audience is the largest audience they'll ever have. Um, you'll dial out to a large universe. Uh, I was on a town hall with a Texas state representative last night. Uh, he spoke to over 750 people. Um, in normal times, 750 people would never show up for a town hall meeting for one single Texas state rep, but he got to speak with that many people all at once. Um, you'll dial out to a very large large universe, the largest universe you can find and is in your budget. Um, and that dial out goes to landlines only. Now, I always tell people dialing out to a large universe is only half the story because you want to get people with cell phones to dial in and participate. Uh, the people who dial in and participate on average will stay on the line uh, sometimes two or three times longer than the people to whom you dial out because you're not going to get those early hangups. Um, in, we encourage people to publicize your event by text message, and we've got an example of one right there. What I love about this is it's a toll-free dial-in number, and there's no PIN. Uh, all you do is click on that text message, and you automatically get dialed in, and you don't have to worry about a PIN. The more friction you can take out of that experience, the better you're going to be and the more participation you're going to have. Um, we want you to publicize that toll-free number on your socials on your email and build that dial-in participation. So that way you've got people you're dialing out to and people who are calling in to you. Um, we have seen uh, candidates and elected officials uh, prepared to take questions from an audience. Uh, we've seen issue advocacy organizations have a lot of success with this, especially those looking to feature a well-known guest. Um, and I will, um, um, and I will also ask you, um, and I do see your question there, Daniel. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, we have seen candidates and elected officials see great success in inviting a doctor to be on the line with them as a special guest for their telephone town hall. Uh, what we found is right now about at least half to two thirds of the questions the audience is asking are health related questions. Now, people are asking budget related questions, policy related questions, but there's a lot of health related questions. And in, unless your candidate is a doctor, it's really difficult to answer those with the level of certainty that a voter wants from you. Um, so we found that inviting a doctor on the line and every state rep, every state senator, every member of Congress, has a friend that they rely on who is a doctor. And that's the person you should get on the line with you and let them help you answer the questions. Uh, we've seen that be really effective. It's, it makes for an interesting conversation, a rich conversation, and you can just take a broader array of questions. Um, Daniel, getting to your question, um, uh, his question is, can Massachusetts candidates cold call cell phone numbers to do automated surveys or must they opt in? Um, cell phones, uh, if you are doing a, uh, if you are dialing cell phones um, to make a live call to them, you don't need permission to make a live call to a cell phone. However, you cannot use an automated dialing system to do it. Uh, if you are going to call a cell phone, you have to use a TCPA compliant manual dialer and the agent has to manually initiate every phone call. Uh, that makes it slower, but it it is absolutely doable, it's legal, it's permissible, you can do it, and it works. Um, because you have to manually initiate every dial, it's slow, which means it's a little bit more expensive than dialing landlines, but you can do it. On the text message side, 
you can send peer-to-peer -peer text messages to cell phones where you do not have an opt-in. You can do that for the same reason that you can manually dial cell phones. On a peer-to-peer -peer text message, an agent has to manually initiate every single outbound text message. So again, as long as there's that manual component, you can do it without an opt-in. Um, you should never be doing robocalls, uh, automated recorded messages to cell phones when you, when you don't have an opt-in, and you should never be doing blast bulk texts from a short code when you don't have an opt-in. So hopefully that answers your question, and uh, um, if not, we can follow up later as well. Yeah, let me just shoot straight, and, and that is, we've got just a few days until this election, election where we have a unique opportunity to prevent an income tax in Texas. This is all about your pocketbook and your future. And I need your help to secure both of those. I need your help to make sure we turn the vote out this November. And then I need your help to make sure uh, we continue that process all the way through the election day so that uh, we elect, uh, re we reelect the president uh, and then we elect uh, people like uh, conservatives to the United States Senate all the way down your local election. So, um, that was actually a sound clip from a telephone town hall that we did with Governor Abbott, uh, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas last October. Um, Governor Abbott dialed out to almost a million Texas voters and uh, then we also sent text messages out to uh, his supporters asking them to dial in. Uh, they had a ballot, uh, a constitutional amendment on their statewide ballot in an odd numbered year when um, voter turnout is of course expected to be low. Uh, they had a uh, statewide uh, referendum to permanently ban the income tax. They enshrined in their state's constitution that no future politicians could ever levy a personal income tax on the people of Texas. Uh, Governor Abbott talked to well over 100,000 people in 90 minutes, an absolutely fantastic example of what you can do with a telephone town hall, and just a fantastic example of one of my favorite governors, too. Um, last but not least, uh, and then I want to take your questions if you've got questions, so please do put them in the chat if you have questions. What you can expect if you come and work with us, if you have any questions about, um, you know, about what your campaign can do right now, how can you leverage the fact that people are at home and they're interested and they're bored and they're looking for something to do, um, how can you uh, make up for the fact that all of your events are canceled? How can you make up for the fact that you can't go door to door, that you can't do tabling at supermarkets to get petitions signed? Um, you you can come to us and you can expect to get advice whether you use our services or you go someplace else. You can always expect that we will brainstorm and try to troubleshoot and find ideas for you. So you can expect that if you come to us with a project, you are gonna get fast service, you're gonna get attention to the details that matter, and you're gonna get expert help with your schedule, with your budgets, and with your script. We're not gonna let something go out that doesn't best represent you, your candidate, your organization, and we're not gonna let something go out that doesn't accomplish the goal that you have. Um, you'll often hear us say, the first question will be, well, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, we're trying to find out from you what you want at the end of it, so that way we can walk back and make sure that, that all of the steps you take, that the, bud the limited budget that you have, the budget you have to use, actually gets used for exactly what you want it to be for. And so um, you can expect uh, this morning, um, I mentioned earlier the uh, election today in Wisconsin, was called off by the governor yesterday and then reinstated by a judge at seven o'clock yesterday evening. Uh, we had two, can two clients, both of which had projects that they had intended to do. So uh, they had, we had live calls that were canceled. We had text messages that were canceled. Both organizations called us back after seven o'clock p.m. last night after having canceled their product projects and said, oh my gosh, can you start those first thing tomorrow morning? Uh, the live calls started before 10 a.m. The text messages were all out the door by noon. So you can expect fast service from us. Usually we tell you we need 24 hours for your live calls and text messages, and we need 72 hours for your telephone town hall because the platforms are booked solid. Um, but if you need something faster, 
don't be afraid to call because if we can get it done, we absolutely will get it done for you. And we'll make sure the details are taken care of and we'll make sure that what you actually put out there, the communication you do put out there is right for you and not just, uh, you know, and not just necessarily execute the, the script that you give us. Um, last but not least, uh, this is uh, Jessica, our administrative assistant, who was trying very, very hard to uh, send out text messages this day. And Waffles, our chief canine officer, uh, is just overseeing and making sure she uh, gets all that work done. But um, in all seriousness, we, uh, we take our work very seriously. We don't take ourselves seriously at all. And so know that if you give us a call, we're going to joke with you. We're going to laugh with you. You might hear a dog bark in the background while we talk to you. Uh, but we'll, uh, we're happy warriors and we're here to get the job done. So um, Marla's, Ken, and Morgan's contact information is there. And whoops. And I think my contact information is there, there as well. So um, those were the four ways we uh, wanted to make sure you knew put four tools into your arsenal so that you can stay live and continue coordinating with people. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Scott, you had a question about how do you keep your calls being flagged by, from potential carriers as potential spam, and what's your workaround if it happens? That's a great question. Uh, let me just take another quick drink here. I've been talking a lot lately. Um, so uh, we rotate caller IDs frequently. Um, typically, if it's a call, it's a project that will go multiple days, we will change the caller ID every day. Um, one of the ways to prevent getting flagged by carriers as potential spam when you're making live calls is to fill in the CNAM. Now, the CNAM is what actually shows up on someone's caller ID. So if, if something shows up on the caller ID other than just the phone number, if you've taken the time to fill that out and get that to uh, drop down to the local carriers, that's going to help. <coughs> One trip, uh, trick that we have learned over the years is use the full name of your candidate, don't abbreviate. Abbreviations get flagged by carriers on live calls more often than a name fully spelled out. If you're asking this question about peer-to-peer -peer texting, um, potential spam and filtering at the carrier level is also problematic with peer-to-peer -peer texting. Um, we, uh, we deal with it in a number of ways. The first is we keep track of potential buzzwords that, flat, that are red flags for spam. And if we see you put one of those in your script, we are going to tell you right away, hey, Scott, yesterday we had three people flagged for spam when they used X, Y, Z. We're going to tell you that and give you some options to change your message. Um, if we are concerned about it, we might approve two or three copies of your text message and then just rotate so that we sort of just stay ahead of the problem. Um, if you're sending out an SMS, which is text only, um, you're going to have an easier time if you use a toll-free number. If you're doing an MMS, which means you're sending a picture, a GIF, a video, uh, you do need to use a local phone number. You can't use a toll-free number for that right now. And so in that case, we're just going to try to do our best to stay ahead of it. And because it's peer-to-peer, -peer, a human being should be watching it. So uh, if your vendor is not watching it, stopping, and then changing it, um, then you should make sure that your vendor's going to do that before you start. So um, from the uh, live call side and from the text side, that is that is an issue. So um, good question. Um, question from Karen, uh, where do we get constituent emails and phone numbers? Um, let me answer the phone number question first. If you've got a candidate who is running for office or is in office, um, it is likely that um, either they already have a list of all of the voters in their district, or they can easily get it from their local party or their state party. So um, for candidates who are partisan candidates running in partisan races, that you should try to get a list first in a way that isn't going to cost you anything. If you can get a list from your state party, it's going to be free. And I would rather you spend your money on the communication rather than spend your money on the list. That being said, um, 
issue advocacy organizations, ballot committees, nonpartisan campaigns often don't have a list of all of the voters in their area. Um, for a nonpartisan campaign, if you're running for municipal office, you can often get it from the auditor and county auditor, the county elections commissioner, usually free or very low cost. And so that's the way I would go. Um, if not, we, uh, we have the ability to purchase data for candidates and for organizations. So um, if you're looking for all of the registered Republicans who have a landline over the age of 55 years old, we can go and purchase that for you. Um, again, I always try to recommend to people that they exhaust every possible option to get the list for free, because then we can make more phone calls, send more texts if we don't have to pay for the list. But if that's not an option, we can acquire for you. Um, in terms of constituent emails, Email collecting is for the most part an organic process. So you should be gathering and collecting emails as part of every other campaign activity that you do. Uh, when you're sending out a mailing and it's got a reply card, ask for the email. When you're doing your fundraising, you should ask for people's emails. When you are getting people to go to your website, when you're signing them up at your Facebook page, uh, you should be organically collecting emails and then sending them a welcome, getting them into your email stream um, and regularly emailing them. So the best way to collect emails is organically. Um, we are, um, our company is not a direct email provider, so, uh, so we don't necessarily do that ourselves, but we certainly can uh, help hook you up and help you find some people that do that. So any other questions? Good questions and lots of them, so awesome. Great, well thank you guys so much for your time today. I appreciate being with you. Um, our email addresses and our phone, phone number is there, so um, anything you need, give us a call. We're, uh, um, we're trying to make sure that during this time when you can't be with voters in person, we don't want to be silent. We don't want you to be silent. This is a time your voice really needs to be heard. And so um, if we can provide a way to get you safely and effectively in front of your audience, uh, that's what we're here to do. So thanks so much and uh, have a great day, everyone.